Steve Bjorklund, my good friend and colleague from the University of Vasa in Finland, will introduce our speaker. Good evening. Hyvä ilta. Gokvel. That was a biling regard, regard from Finland. Uh, as a member of the planning committee, it is a great pleasure and a great honor for me to welcome the presenter of the opening keynote speech of this conference. Ellen Bialystik is a dis distinguished research professor of psychology at York University, and her contributions to the research field of bilingualism and cognitive development are both impressive and outstanding. To me and many other researchers on second language ac acquisition around the world, Professor Ellen Bialystik's research has during decades served as true eye-openers, adding and pushing new avenues of research in the, field of, in the field and helping both researchers and teachers to understand bilingualism from a cognitive perspective. The extensive research conducted by Professor Ellen Bialystik started with an interest in children's language and cognitive development that soon also encompassed bilingual children and execu executive functions in bilingual children in contrast to monolingual children. Other research includes studies of literacy acquisition in young children, models of metalinguistic awareness and second language acquisition. Results from these studies have been published in books such as Communication Strategies, Psychological Analysis of Second Language Use from 1990, that is a, 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 a book I still remember, um, coming back to every now and then. Language Processing in Bilingual Children, published in 1991. In other words, The Science and Psychology of Second Language Acquisition, together with Professor Kenny Hakuta in 1994, and Bilingualism in the Development, Language Literacy and Cognition in, in 2001. In addition, she is the author of over 100 scientific papers in journals and books and has served in the editorial boards of several scientific journals, among others, International Journal of Bilingualism, Second Language Research, Bilingualism, Language and Cognition, Cognitive Development and Applied Psycholinguistics. For her valuable and prestigious contributions and prominent work within the research field, Professor Ellen Bialystik has been awarded with the Canadian Society for Brain Behavior and Cognitive Science HEB Award in 2011, Killam Prize for the Social Sciences in 2010, York University President's Research Award of Merit in 2009. The most recent award is the Walter Gordon York Research, Research Chair of Lifespan, of Lifespan Cognitive Development at York University, and in June, 2016, she was named an Officer of the Order of Canada. Congratulations. Personally, I would like to thank Professor Lembialistic for providing me with a very useful and powerful argument to put forward to my university students who start studying second language acquisition and, and bilingualism. Professor Lembialistic has namely also extended her research to studies of adult processing, aging, and lifelong bilingualism. The bilingual advantage found in terms of a, de of a delay of the onset of de dementia is an unbeatable argument to students in holding on to bilingualism through all years. <laughs> so now we are all looking forward to hear Professor Ellen Bialystik sharing her thoughts with us about bilingualism in education, implications for bilingual education and minority language study students. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ellen Bialystik. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. Is this working? Okay. And thank you to Roy and Dee for inviting me to this conference. I think this conference is really one of the hidden jewels. I didn't know about it before, um, but that was my, I was missing something. So I'm very pleased uh, to be here and I want to talk to you about some things I've been thinking about 
trying to figure out how the work I do in basic psychology and cognitive neuroscience can help us understand what happens to children in school, what happens when educational programs and options and alternatives are presented, how do these choices affect the development of children, because ultimately that's what we're interested in. So what do we know about bilingual education? Now, I have to apologize at first because I'm not lecturing you about this. You are the experts in bilingual education. What I'm going to try to do on the next couple of slides is clarify what the relevant distinctions are. As we just heard from the senator, there's many ways of thinking about what bilingual education could be. And all of the comments that I'm going to make about cognitive implications, about academic outcomes, depend deeply on how we're thinking about bilingual education. What do we really mean? What kind? So what is bilingual education? It's many, many things. And I put in various kinds of educational options that we might think about. In this country in particular, we also have a concept of what kind of student is in a bilingual education program. Who are these students? In the United States, they tend to have certain characteristics. They tend to be Hispanic, they tend to be poor, they tend to have low family education, and so on. This is a problem. Because if we want to understand what bilingual education is in this country, these two descriptions get conflated, and we no longer see them as separate. But our problem is to understand bilingual education in its general sense so we can rationally, empirically, and logically figure out how it impacts on children's development. So we need to separate what we know, whoops, this is a little bit jumpy, separate out that particular demographic who is a big user of bilingual education so we can ask the question. So that's kind of how I want to think about uh, what the implications of bilingual education are broadly. And I'm going to come back to children who are in this circle and, un and examine how the implications apply to them and whether it's any different um, for other demographics. All right. Now, in general, the outcomes of bilingual education, the outcomes of any education program, depend on many things. And I'll just put them up very quickly. You can't examine a program in the absence of the children who are in the program. And we know that a language education program obviously uh, depends very much on all of these factors. Is the language a minority or majority language? What's the socioeconomic context? What is the language proficiency and other individual differences of the children? How smart are they? How literate are they? And so on. So. You can't just plug in to a bilingual education program and expect to be able to figure out what the outcomes are. You need to consider the context. So if that doesn't sound already hopelessly difficult, I want to turn to thinking about different ways that kids become bilingual. I'm going to look at three concepts that I'm calling bilingualism, immersion education, and dual language education. The last two are varieties of bilingual education. So here's the difference among them, because the differences are really, really important. Bilingualism, that's when you have a child who goes to school in a country like this, in a city like Minneapolis, and the program is in English. But the child goes home after school, and the family speaks something else. 
for the child is bilingual. Immersion education is Canada's great gift to the world of education, where some people figured out you could switch these things around. You could take the school, the home language, these are kids who are native speakers of English, and swap around the other language. So now they're not using English at school. Again, these kids are bilingual. <clears throat> Dual language education is somewhat different. Here we again have primarily English as the language of schooling, and primarily something else at home, and in many cases in this country, it's Spanish. And what happens is that you bring that in as well into school, so there's two languages being involved. In all these cases, we are creating bilingual children. And in all of these cases, the children are going to develop their cognitive and linguistic skills in a way that's quite different from what any of them would be doing if they were only living and studying in one language. So what I'm going to, so we want to think about the implications. So this is one more way of looking at it. This is the same structure, these three ways of being bilingual. Who are these kids? In the bilingualism scenario that I told you about, these are kids who do not speak English at home, so we can't really predict what their English proficiency is. It's probably OK after they've been in school for a few years. It's almost certainly OK. But it would be variable. Are these kids at risk for academic failure? No, not particularly. They're fine. In immersion education, these kids are native speakers of English. Their English is fine. And again, there's no risk factors. In dual language education, we have a different situation because these were the kids in that first bubble I showed you where they do have many challenges and their English proficiency may be very low and they may have many other risk factors as well. So when we're comparing the outcomes of these programs, we have to keep in mind that these are different kids. I'm going to show you research with all these kinds of kids all of them, where we're looking at precisely these configurations and we'll compare and consider what happens to their language and cognitive development. I'll give you a spoiler alert because I don't want you to hate me. They're all okay. They all do fine, okay? But let's look at what the different ways of the, the configurations and how they come to this common conclusion. All right, so, so what I want to look at is how these different types of bilingual education or different ways of becoming bilingual um, impact on language and cognitive development and academic success. And I want to be able to understand what the contribution is from individual differences in children. And, and remember, the context I'm going to try to come back to at the end is how to think about education for uh, minority language at-risk children. So bilingual minds, this is what I study. What's going on in a bilingual mind? Now we know from a lot of research now that neuroplasticity is real. It's a thing. You are what you eat. Everything you do changes your mind and brain. So if you're involved in intense activity, that activity over time reconfigures and forms your mind. And we know it's true for musical training, it's true for video gaming, it's true for many experiences. Now bilingualism is about the most intense experience you can have because you're using your mind all the time. And there's something very counterintuitive 
about the bilingual mind that's probably at the core of all of the consequences of bilingualism we've ever found. And that thing is joint activation. It's counterintuitive. But if you know two languages, no matter where you are, what the context, who you're speaking to, both languages are active. Even if you don't need Spanish in this room, even if you don't need Portuguese in this room, that language is working its way through all of your processing while you're listening to me speak English. So what you have then is a problem. You have a conflict. You can see that sometimes the languages overlap, sometimes they don't. It doesn't matter. There is always the need to select. And a lifetime of selecting the language you need and not the language that's also activated is amazing brain exercise. And that's the basis of all of the consequences of bilingualism that we found. So what we see in particular are, again, counterintuitively, language acquisition and language processing are more effortful for bilinguals. You train them up on language and they're worse at language. Go figure. But cognitive processing, and in particular, executive functioning or executive control, the processes that are used to select the target language, they get better and better. So it's this practice in selecting the language you need that boosts that part of the brain and those cognitive systems. Those are the consequences of bilingualism. Why do we care? Because for children, developing executive functioning processes is the single most important cognitive thing that happens in childhood. And executive functioning predicts academic success, lifetime health and well-being, and uh, achievement throughout life. So very important consequence. So what we're going to do now is look at these consequences, the language and cognitive consequences, in terms of bilingual education, in particular, the bilingual education uh, distinctions that I showed you earlier. Let's start with language. I only have a couple of slides on this, but I just want to make the point. I said language processing is more effortful. There's lots of evidence to show that. But we also know that bilinguals have a smaller vocabulary in each language than a monolingual speaker of that language. Okay? How do we know this? Well, we've given standardized vocabulary tests to many of the participants who've been through our lab over the years. So at one point, we thought we would just gather them up and put them in one graph because the task we use is a standardized test, the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test. It's a measure of English vocabulary. And because it's standardized, you can just mush together, you know, however many people you gave the test to. The scores are all scaled for their age, so you can put them all on the same scale. So what's the vocabulary of monolingual and bilingual children. What we have here is, these are uh, distributions. These are data, this is probably too small to see. We have 772 monolinguals, 966 bilinguals. The mean score of this test is 100 because it's standardized. And what you see is the monolingual distribution in red, which is perfectly normal, has a higher mean score than the bilingual distribution in blue, which is also perfectly normal. What does this mean? Now, that difference in mean scores is highly significant. How do we interpret it? Does this mean that monolinguals simply have better vocabularies? That we have to chalk this up as some kind of a deficit, a bad outcome of bilingualism. Don't make your kid bilingual. They won't know enough words. 
here's how you really have to read this graph. There's the mean average population score, 100. Do monolingual children have higher vocabulary scores than bilingual children? Those are the monolinguals for whom that sentence is true. Do bilinguals have worse vocabulary? No, only them. Everybody else is in the middle. And this is the statistical point that nobody really understands. When you talk about on average over a population, you're not talking about individuals. So we can say that on average over a population, monolinguals tend to have higher vocabularies, but that doesn't mean a thing for an individual bilingual child. Here's another way of looking at it. We pulled out of that um, very large data set only kids who were six years old and in first grade. And instead of looking at their standardized scores, we just counted up how many words they knew on the test, and we divided the words into two groups. So those are their scores. The red, again, is the monolinguals. We even divided this into bilinguals whose other language is um, Asian and bilinguals whose other language is not Asian. You can see it makes no difference at all. So our overall, by monolinguals, no more of these words than bilinguals, OK? How worried should we be? We divided these words up into words that they're likely to have learned or use at home and words that they're likely to learn or use at school. When we're looking at home words, indeed, the bilinguals don't know things like the English word for spatula or turnip or barbecue or whatever. But if you look at words that are conceptual, academic, and school-based, there's no difference. So again, how do you interpret the evidence? How do we jump to conclusions that kids are dealing with challenges that aren't really problems at all? <clears throat> I'm going to skip this. All right, I'm going to move to cognition. My main work is in researching the cognitive and brain effects of bilingualism across the lifespan. So what I've done is I've put my entire life's work onto one slide. I mean, you know, there it is. It's all. <laughs> so we study um, so participants across the lifespan, infants in the first year of life, lots of stuff with children, young adults who are basically Psych 100 students who have to be in experiments in order to graduate, and older adults who are either experiencing healthy aging or uh, patients. We do both. We, uh, we use behavior measures, and um, these are behavioral tasks on the top half, but we also do brain studies, and those are the ones on the bottom half. What the designations of little green check marks and red X's means is what the plurality of evidence for that particular thing, that particular line item shows. Um, where there's green check marks, that indicates that the plurality of evidence shows that bilinguals are better than monolinguals on that kind of study. Where there's a red X, it means that there is basically no little or no difference between groups. So it's not like bilinguals are better than everything all the time. It's very important to see the data in terms of the constraints around it. So this is what we know. We know that, on average, bilingual individuals are better than their monolingual counterparts in performing tasks that test the executive function system. These are processes like selecting, like picking the right language, shifting between two different things that you're trying to do at the same time, avoiding interference, holding things in mind, 
and moving them around. Um, these are all aspects of the executive function system. And these are all things that, on average, are better by, by, by bilinguals. And again, to restate my earlier point, this really matters for kids, because this is crucial in development. So what we want to look at is the extent to which this general pattern that we find for bilinguals, people who are home bilinguals, heritage language bilinguals, simultaneous native bilinguals, whether we find any of this for kids in one of those configurations of bilingual education. That's the question. So I'm just going to start with one study that we did and then kind of pivot. Pivot is a word I don't think I've ever used, but it's been used so much in this election campaign. I'm totally influenced by it. I'm going to pivot to a different point. I'm going to talk about emails, OK? This is a study we did. It's uh, the history, the backstory of the study is actually kind of interesting because we thought we were doing two completely independent studies. And when they both finished, we were astounded to see that they had the same results. So we want to look at what was happening in kids in two different immersion programs. In in this sense, the kids are becoming bilingual, so we're not comparing monolinguals and bilinguals. We're looking at kids who are becoming bilingual. In the first study, we investigated 100 children who were 7 to 9 years old who were attending a Hebrew day school. These kids all speak English at home. Now, there's kids in the program who don't but we excluded them from the analysis. So in the analysis, these are all kids who speak English at home, and most of them, half, half to three quarters of the instruction days in Hebrew, so it's an immersion program. In the second study, smaller group, these were kids 10 to 11 years old in a, a French education program. It's not French immersion, it was a private French school that operates like an immersion program. And we just want to know how they're doing. So we gave them a metalinguistic task, and we gave them some executive control tasks. But because we so foolishly, so blindly didn't realize we're doing the same study twice, we gave them different tasks. That was totally crazy. We just picked different things. Now, the data are now analyzed by a regression model. So we have the outcome scores for their metalinguistic task and for their executive function task. And a regression analysis tells you what is predicting the outcome. So for example, um, age, for children growing up, age predicts height. Basically, the older you are, the taller you are. So that's the kind of prediction we're looking for. What's predicting the outcomes for children doing these metalinguistic and executive function tasks? And our regression models put in, whoa, very sensitive. We put in um, age. These color codes will become important uh, when you see the graph in the next slide. Uh, the child's age, obviously, older kids are smarter than younger kids. It's one of the great insights of developmental psychology. We put in the red things, I'm looking at sort of intelligence measures, a nonverbal IQ fluid intelligence test, and this um, English vocabulary test. Because they're all native speakers of English, this, this uh, vocabulary test is really measuring verbal intelligence because they're native speakers. It's not measuring English proficiency. But we also had two other variables. Because they were either, their other language was either Hebrew or English, we also tested them in Hebrew or English. And we could get a score, uh, an, a vocabulary measure showing the ratio of their two languages, where the closer that ratio approaches one, the more bilingual they were. So we knew how bilingual they were. And time in the program. These are, the, these are all, uh, these are private programs and they operate like drop-in centers. Kids come and go. 
You can come in grade two. You can leave in grade four. You can come in grade three. You can do anything. So all of the kids had been in the program for a different length of time when we got there. So we included a variable, how long have they been in the program? So three kinds of variables, how old they are, how smart they are, that's the red one, and how bilingual they are, that's the green one, okay? Here's the results. Let's look first at the metalinguistic tasks. Now in study one, it was a morphological awareness task, and when you, the purple is unexplained, that's, you know, this. You can't explain everything, but this is a very normal kind of result. So how, what's explaining performance on this metalinguistic task in study one? You could see that the biggest chunk is red, and that's how smart they are. And if we look in study two, where they had a completely different metalinguistic task, it's still red. So this different program, different everything, and how well they did is predicted by how smart they are. Now let's go back to study one. And they did um, an executive control task. They did a flanker task. What's predicting performance? You don't see any red anymore. It doesn't matter how smart they are. Now it's green. It's how bilingual they are. The more bilingual they are, the better they're doing on this task. And if we go to study two, where they did a completely different executive function task, we got exactly the same results. So remember that study one, these are the same kids, and these are the same kids. But what matters is what you're testing. So what we could see is the more language proficiency, the smarter they are, the better metalinguistic outcomes they had. But the more bilingual they were, and the more bilingual experience they had, the better their executive function outcomes. That's the basis for what I'm going to turn to now and talk about more specific factors that we can connect to bilingual education. <clears throat> I'm going to look at three. I'm going to look at what happens to kids who come in with different kinds of abilities as a starting point. What happens when you're dealing with populations who have different socioeconomic levels? And what happens when you're dealing with risk factors? All of these things are well known, well known to affect educational outcomes. We all know this, right? But the question here is, do they interact with bilingualism in affecting outcomes for those children? That's a different question. OK. So I'm going to begin with attention, attention disorders and other such things in education. ADHD is very prevalent. Um, something like 6 or 7% of children have a clinical diagnosis of ADHD or some attentional disorder. And they struggle in school. These are real conditions with real consequences. <clears throat> Now, to be clinically diagnosed as having an attentional disorder, you're at an extreme end of what's actually a continuum. Because if you take the ability to control attention, to focus, to concentrate, that varies across the population in a kind of a normal distribution. So it's only the really extreme end that becomes diagnosed as clinical. Does this interact with bilingualism? And I'm thinking here not so much about the clinical end as the place on the scale. Well, what happens, the, the issue of special needs kids in bilingual education has been around for as long as there's been bilingual education. We've always known this is, this is a problem, and this is an incredibly different, difficult area to research. Now, here's why it's difficult to research. What are you comparing this to? 
let's say you have a smiley, typically developing kid and a smiley ADHD kid. And they're both perfectly normal kids who are exactly the same, except one of them has a clinical diagnosis of ADHD. And you want to know how they're going to do in a bilingual education program. How do you go about setting up the experiment to even ask the question? So we have two buckets. Buckets. There's another word that now carries connotations I never imagined. One bucket we're calling single language education and the other bilingual education. And we're going to take our very nice smiley typically developing kid and drop that kid into single language. And we're going to take another lovely single typically developing kid and drop that into bilingual education. So we want to know how bilingualism or bilingual education is affecting these kids' outcomes. So you compare them. It's easy. Now we also want to know how this kid with ADHD is going to do. And they often are in a single language regular program. So here the question is, how does this ADHD kid compare to her classmates in that single language program? We can answer that. We know how to look at it. We know what kinds of measures to use. We know how to interpret the results. What about an ADHD kid who is in a bilingual education program? What do we do? Do we compare that kid to the typically developing kid in the, in the bilingual education program? You can't. You won't know how to interpret it. What you have to do, the hard part of this research, is you really have to compare to a typically developing kid in a single language program. Almost nobody does that. So if you compare the kid in the bilingual education program, all you're going to say is, hmm, not doing well. Bilingual education isn't a good idea for those kids. We should exclude them. Why? It's the wrong comparison. So these contrasts matter. Um, and it's very difficult research. I noticed on the program, Fred Genesee has a symposium tomorrow. Um, and I'm sure they will make all the right comparisons. So these are important questions. And it's very hard research to do. So here's the underlying question. We know that we need to develop kids' executive function ability. We know bilingualism boosts that development and uh, accelerates it. We know that an attentional disorder makes it problematic, slows it down. We know almost nothing about what happens if they're both existing in the same kids. What happens? We don't know. So here's the study that we did. As I said, we didn't look at kids who were clinically diagnosed, we took advantage of the fact that this attentional control is normally distributed through the population, and so is bilingualism. I wasn't going to talk about that, but I'm sure you all know what I mean. Bilingualism is a continuous variable, not a categorical variable. You can be bilingual to various degrees. So what we look at is children who varied in their degree of bilingualism, and in their degree of attentional ability. And we wanted to look at the relationship between those background descriptions on executive function. We had 208 children. They're all typically developing. They're all in public schools from very different uh, communities. <clears throat> and we gave them three tests of executive function. We gave them a simple flanker task. I don't want to get bogged down to details of what these tests are. So if you want to ask me later, I'm happy to tell you. But I'd rather just give you a big picture. So this is a standard, simple um, executive function task where you have to figure out, you have to pay attention to where the middle arrow is pointing and not look at the outside arrow, arrows. Um, 
And again, these are regression models. It's awfully small, isn't it? Can you see it even? In the pie chart, um, bilingualism is in red, and attention is in that sort of greenish, yucky color. It's a really hot. And then there's an interaction. So what does this result show? The more bilingual kids were, the better they did significantly. And the better their attentional control, the better they did. There was a small interaction, but not very meaningful. So here, both bilingualism and attentional control are pushing kids to do better on this executive function task. This is a spatial working memory task that we've been using in our research. You have to remember a sequence of spatial locations and then give them back in a reverse order. And the results are kids who were more bilingual did better. That's it. Here, attentional control didn't help, I think because it wasn't a time task. So more bilingual, better working memory. Working memory is central to executive functioning. And the third task is this um, inhibition task. You press a button until you get a cue that says, this time don't press. And when you're in a real rhythm of pressing, it's, it requires a lot of control to not press. So we gave them that task. And like the first one, kids who were more bilingual did better. Kids who had better attentional control did better. And obviously, we control for everything else. We make sure that we're, you know, there's no effect of intelligence or age or anything like that. These significant effects come out after we've controlled for everything. So they're real effects. So these kids who are in the public school system and just happen to have different kinds of bilingual experience at home, the more bilingual they are, the better they're doing on these tasks. Second, so what about SES? SES is really important. One of the most reliable findings in both education and development is the immense role that higher SES plays. So what about bilingualism? There was some talk for a while that all of these things I was saying about bilingual kids really were just SES effects. They weren't bilingualism effects. So we had to do a couple of studies. All right. This study, this was done by a former graduate student of mine, Alejandra Calvo. Um, and I said, and she was interested in SES and how it was going to work out. And I said, OK, we're going to do a study. And it's for your PhD, but I want you to do a really high risk study. Anybody can do a study where you have you know, rich kids and poor kids and you show they're different. That's easy. Are you willing to do a really high risk study? And Alejandra, who's fantastic, said yes, she was. So here's what we did. We went into ordinary public schools in Toronto, and we gave background questionnaires to everybody. If you're working in Toronto, you just close your eyes and dip in, and 50% of the kids are bilingual, because that's um, the demographic. It's a very diverse city. For SES, we decided we're going to look at parents' education only, and not look for rich and poor, high or low. We had a subtle distinction, what we're calling working class and middle class. So working class, parents have completed up to high school. And middle class, parents have post-secondary education. That's it. That's the only difference. None of these kids live in poverty, and none of them is at risk. And here's the other thing. You see that we could create four cells, working class monolingual or bilingual, middle class monolingual or bilingual. These kids go to school together. They're in the same classrooms. 
We had classrooms in the study in which kids ended up filling three different cells. So these kids play soccer together. They're in the same school. The differences are really pretty subtle, OK? And we wanted to see if we could use a subtle distinction like that and see how that might interact with bilingualism in determining outcomes that we're interested in. We gave them three batches of tasks for its cognitive ability. How smart are they? Everybody's exactly the same. Not a single difference on any of the cognitive ability tasks. These kids are all exactly the same. The next two batches were uh, some language tasks and some executive control tasks. And we created sort of conglomerate summary factor scores for each of the language measures and the executive function measures. Here are the results. Here's how you have to read this graph. It looks like a lot. Now, red is monolingual, blue is bilingual. Solid is working class. And hashed is middle class. Look first at the right side, at the language tasks. These are standard scores. So what the bars are telling you is whether that group is scoring higher than the, stand, than the average for the whole study or lower than the average for the whole study. So if we start over here, I use this so everybody can see it, on the language task, you'll see the red bars go up and the blue bars go down. That means that for both working class and middle class, the monolingual kids are doing better than the bilingual kids. You can also see that these two N, the hashed bars, are overall higher than the solid bars. That's the SES effect. So middle class kids know more words than working class kids. Two strong main effects. Now look over to the left side. These are the executive function scores. And now it's the blue lines that are going up and the red lines that are going down. And they're happening again in both SCS groups. And again, overall, the lines are higher for the middle class kids. So this shows very clearly that, of course, there are effects of SES. But there are also effects of bilingualism, and they're independent. So these kids are responding to both experiences. Bilingualism makes language go down and executive function go up, as I showed you earlier on. And SES has a more uniform effect. I'm going to skip this one. OK. <clears throat> last last uh, point I'm going to talk about. We're going to move into that last group on the uh, slide I showed you early on, where these kids are in bilingual education, but they're also at risk. Other things are going on in their lives. So we did a study to examine whether being more bilingual in the context of a high-risk situation is helpful. Is it even helpful? in these very difficult circumstances. We went into the Central Valley in California, and we found a community of low SES, um, bilingual to various degree, Hispanic kids, most Mexican, uh, children of Mexican immigrants. And as in one or two of the other studies I've already shown you, you can actually scale these kids, how bilingual are they, um, on something that is a meaningful measure of degree of bilingualism. It's a complicated study because they're all in some form of bilingual education, but it's not exactly the same. And as you probably all know much better than I do, 
it's complicated, and then they get tested, and then they can convert, and then they go into mainstream English, and it's all very complicated. So we try to kind of keep all that dust out of it so we could just look at these kids. Um, we ended up with 64 kids, not a huge sample for this kind of research, but very difficult to do. They were about eight and a half years old. And we used the same design I've been showing you. We gave them a bunch of background measures to get their um, so, you know, SES backgrounds, their age, their parents' education, their IQ. We gave them English proficiency and a bilingualism score, which is the ratio of an English proficiency test and a Spanish proficiency test. We gave them the Spanish equivalent of the PPVT. And the ratio of those two scores is how bilingual they are, okay? So these kids have a lot of issues, but what we want us to focus on is in this context, does it help to be more bilingual? And you're going to see exactly the same three tasks you just saw in that attention study because we're not very creative. They were sitting around, so we used them. All right, so again, these are regression models. And here's what we found. There's the flanker task. So for these kids, and I have to say, when we look at the scores of these kids on all the measures, their absolute scores on everything we gave them were at least a standard deviation lower than we're used to seeing in the samples we work with. So everything is at a kind of a different level, but that's not our question. We're not comparing them to anybody. We're asking if being more bilingual is helpful. Give them the flanker task, absolutely it is. Um, here bilingualism is blue. Just to keep you confused, somebody changed the colors on me. So the slice of blue is how much being more bilingual is explaining their performance. That's a big slice. That <clears throat> froggy thing, the uh, working memory thing, again, the blue is significant. The more bilingual they are, the better their working memory on this task. On that third inhibition task, nothing was significant. That just didn't show us anything. But crucially, on these other two tasks, for kids who really are not used to uh, doing better than other kids, the more bilingual they were, uh, the better their scores. What can we say about minority language children in bilingual education? Well, I think in general, we've seen several times that on average, Bilingualism leads to kind of a reduction in language measures, but an enhancement of executive function measures. But do keep in mind what I told you about interpreting those language scores. And they're found, the same pattern is found for bilingual education. And the same pattern is found no matter who the bilingual population is. We see it with privileged bilingual kids who have all kinds of advantages. And we see exactly the same pattern in Central California for kids who have few, if any, advantages. What boosts their performance is exactly the same as we saw in those private immersion schools, being more bilingual their performance was better. Now these other factors, SCS, attentional control, at risk, they all matter. They matter very much. And in every case, there was an effect. If you think about the SCS study I showed you with those blue and red bars, the, word, the middle class kids were always doing better than the working class kids, always. But that's separate from the effect of bilingualism. In the attentional control study, there was a pie slice for better attentional control. But there was for bilingualism, too. 
And in the California study, those kids' scores are pretty poor. They're lower than we see in the kids we usually work with. But the pattern is the same. Being more bilingual leads to better outcomes. So these other factors, which obviously remain um, important, don't reverse or compromise the overall effect of bilingualism, even bilingualism in the context of bilingual education. So education has an important role to play, both in creating bilinguals and also in harnessing these very uh, positive effects of bilingualism. And I thank you very much. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. Hello, thank you. I had a question concerning the Peabody test. I was wondering if the children were at the opportunity to answer the questions about the vocab in the native language, for example, or was it only in English? No, it, it's a test of English words. It's a vocabulary test. So, you know, it exists in other languages. We translate it into other languages. But the so, purpose of the test is just to measure English vocabulary. So it's the proficiency in English yeah. that is not the same, but the semantic repertoire that they have might oh, be yeah, right. are the same, right? Absolutely. So when I think that's an important point, of course. So if children, uh, if bilingual children um, know fewer words on this English test, they have a whole other language. Of course, of course they do. And I, I didn't mean to imply that this was an exhaustive measure of their vocabulary. Thank you for pointing it out. One more question? Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, you've mentioned repeatedly the advantages for bilingualism in terms of executive function or executive control. Can you talk a little bit about the practical advantages of what that provides you, you know, in daily life? Okay, I'm going to answer it in two kinds of ways. Okay, first of all, executive control is something that underlies all complex thought. Every complex activity you engage in, every time you try to do two things at the same time, um, you're using ex the executive control system. Um, it's kind of the central manager for attention in your mind. We, the executive control system is a network, it's a brain network, it's not one region in the brain, but the network crucially includes uh, the regions in the very front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, plus some subcortical areas, caudate nucleus and stuff. So throughout life, presumably, 
uh, bilinguals are better at things like multitasking and driving down the highway and not missing their exit and all that sort of stuff. But it's just an efficiency thing. Where it really matters is in aging because the executive function system starts to decline, fasten your seatbelt kids, starts to decline at around 30. <laughs> That's why most of you can no longer multitask. I don't even try anymore. So this is a natural um, aspect of cognitive aging. So what's happening in the bilingual mind is that the lifetime of using that network, engaging the front part of the brain, in, uh, establishes that network so that when cognitive aging really goes off the tracks, when we get things like mild cognitive impairment, when we get not normal healthy aging, but neurodegeneration, bilinguals can compensate for the degeneration in the middle of the brain where memory is by over-recruiting these much better frontal regions. So the real payoff for having great executive function networks is the potential for those networks to compensate for failures in other brain regions. So we have data, we were the first to publish this finding, but it's now been widely replicated, that on average, bilinguals present symptoms of Alzheimer's disease about four years later than monolinguals, all else is equal. They have the disease, their brains are showing all of the evidence of the disease, but their behavior is not. So that's the real payoff. Thank you so Thank very you. much. Thank you very much.